Welcome to the Connecticut coast, home to America's most exclusive beaches. Countless signs warn against trespassing that police take notice. Private property, no parking. And parking, no parking. is non-existent. They're very, very, very clear that you can't park. Everything's private. Residents here will stop at nothing to keep undesirables out of their private oasis. But how did these wealthy few come to own nearly 70% of the Connecticut shoreline? I began this video with my nose stuck in a book, Andrew Carl's Free the Beaches, a vivid account of the history of Connecticut's shoreline and one man's quest to free it from the clutches of the ultra wealthy. About halfway through reading about America's most insular communities decked out with fences and private security forces, I had the bright idea of barreling through these communities making a beeline to the beach in a beat up van filled with cameras. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Oh my goodness. Security checkpoint? We cannot get in there. A private security checkpoint? It's like Checkpoint Charlie? And they have, they have the Berlin Wall over there? Wow, that was kind of a waste of my sweet Patreon cash that funded the production of this video. If you want to support me and my crazy adventures, don't forget that for less than one millionth of the cost of a home in Old Lyme, you could give a token of support on Patreon. Anyways, I really underestimated how hard it would be to set foot on the beach. We were able to find somewhere to put down our camera at Rocky Neck State Park, but I certainly didn't think the beaches in Old Lyme would be less accessible than West Berlin during the Soviet era. Considering the history of the area, however, it makes sense. While the properties of Old Lyme are highly exclusive at the moment, they weren't always only affordable to the very, 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 very wealthy. Originally, these properties were bought up by a professional class from Hartford coming down to the shoreline to buy themselves a nice summer cottage. Now, Andrew Carl doesn't make this connection, but I like to think of these areas as being sort of like Disney World in the sense that they have charters to operate independently from the state, governing themselves and managing their own infrastructure. As he explains in the book, this was necessary because the rural areas where these communities were built lacked sewers and roads and other infrastructure, so the developers kind of had to do it all on their own. Carl's research revealed that while these properties were once accessible to a professional class of white city dwellers, black and Jewish people were explicitly forbidden from buying properties on the shoreline, assuming they could afford to. The restrictions on Jewish people eased over time. Black people people, no matter how wealthy, were never really welcome on the Connecticut coast. Even Jackie Robinson's wife, with her millions of dollars, was turned away when looking for a home for her family in the affluent town of Greenwich. Practices such as redlining kept black communities out of the suburb and constrained in small sections of cities like Hartford's North End. Unable to transact with legitimate landlords, black tenants had no choice but to put up with slumlords, often living in cramped tenements infested with rats. Though public housing projects eventually replaced the slums, without any funding, the condition of these projects rapidly worsened to the point of being no better than the buildings that were demolished to construct them. Andrew Carl points to poor conditions in the housing projects, as well as extreme summer heat, as factors exacerbating the residents' thirst for a place to cool off and have fun. And in cities like Hartford, those places didn't exist. Kids would often open fire hydrants to stay cool and play, leading to altercations with police that were underscored by rising racial tensions during the 1960s. It was only a matter of time before someone attempted to take kids to the beach in hopes of avoiding altercations with police or letting children drown in the polluted rivers near the projects while trying to cool off. Though seemingly isolated from the problems of the inner city, Shoreline towns nevertheless feared that outsiders would invade their picturesque communities. In these towns that were, in some cases, literally 99% white, it doesn't take a genius to figure out which skin color these terrifying outsiders were imagined to be. The worst nightmares of these communities came true when in mid-August of 1971, a busload of black children from Hartford's North End arrived at Old Lime Shores, which is the community down the road from Checkpoint Charlie. According to one homeowner quoted in the book, residents of Old Lime Shores reacted to this group of adorable kids as if the black 
Black Panthers had arrived en masse. According to Andrew Carl, teenagers shouted epithets at the children while police descended upon the scene within minutes, threatening to arrest everyone who wasn't a guest of a Beach Association member. Luckily, a woman stepped off her porch and declared, much to the anger of her neighbors, that all of the children were her guests. She and some others who were appalled at the reaction of the residents of Old Lime Shores stepped forward and took the kids into their homes, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. The activist who organized this trip, Ned Cole, originally just wanted to get children out of Hartford's North End and to the beach, but was enraged by the treatment the kids received in Old Lyme. This book, which is in large part a biography of Ned Cole, states that this encounter inspired a crusade against these shoreline towns, where Ned bussed hundreds of children to Connecticut's most private beach associations. They learned that they could waltz along the shore with little fear of being arrested because Legally speaking, you can't own the beach, at least in Connecticut. Anything up to the mean high waterline is fair game. Meaning you could march down to Greenwich, Connecticut, hop in the water, go on the wet part of the shore at low tide, and construct a giant sandcastle shaped like a middle finger, and there's nothing anyone can do about you exercising your right to free speech on public land. Ned Cole knew that to some people in Greenwich, black children daring to have fun on their beach was far more offensive than any middle finger sand sculpture. Broadcasted across the country on the news, Ned's invasions of America's most elite beaches, orchestrated by a vast network of parent chaperones, made the people of Greenwich the laughing stock of the nation. But to Connecticut shoreline residents, this was no laughing matter. They viewed Ned's activism as a threat to their way of life and the privacy of the beaches they called their own. Though Ned's invasions ceased and the nation soon forgot about the whole fiasco, Andrew Carl's recent interviews of Shoreline residents reveal that they have not forgotten in the slightest. Even those who don't know Ned by name still make references to busloads of people from Hartford invading their towns in the near future. Talk of such apocalyptic predictions was on the rise in 1995 when a young law student Brendan Layden sued the town of Greenwich over being denied entry to Greenwich Point Park. As Carl frames it, he took up Ned Cole's cause, arguing that denying entry to the park violated not only the public trust doctrine, as people couldn't access the public land along the shore, but was also unconstitutional on First Amendment grounds. Layden argued that such public land was a prime place to exercise your right to free speech. And as evidence to prove that point was news footage of Ned Cole's demonstrations, as well as passionate testimony from Ned Cole himself. After the case was appealed all the way up to Connecticut's Supreme Court, Greenwich, after spending over $100,000 on the best lawyers and expert witnesses money could buy, lost their case to a law student who spent less than two grand on the trial. Greenwich lost because the case they made that opening the park to the public would have deleterious effects on the economy, the environment, it would violate property rights, was extremely weak. Andrew Carl is clear that the law was on Leyden's side, but also that the political tide in the Northeast at the time was somewhat turning against shoreline residents. Before the case went to trial, Neighboring New Jersey saw its town beaches open to the public after Shoreline Towns' non-resident restrictions on beach access were challenged in court. Shoreline residents feared that what happened in Oregon and Texas decades before when legislation guaranteed public access to the beach would happen in Connecticut as well. These fears never came true. Connecticut's landmark Supreme Court decision had a negligible impact on access to the beach. Though towns were required to allow residents access, they were not required to provide parking or free access. Towns simply charged ridiculous amounts of money for non-resident seasonal passes. So this is the public beach is what we're hitting first. Turn left on Old Boston Post Road. Is this it? Will be on the left. I don't know. No parking anytime. So where do we park? Is that blocked off? No, it's not. No. Okay. Okay. Oops. Well, parking like with pass only. Okay. Nice. What do we do? I don't know where you park, honestly. Um, parking. So you have to buy a pass and a pass for outside residents like a hundred dollars. So we're kind of screwed. <laughs> this is how they keep people out. 
is you just cannot put a car anywhere. Because nobody can afford to pay those rates, the beaches are as out of reach from the general public as ever. <sighs> the final chapters of the book describe the contemporary economic forces facing Connecticut. As property values along the coast rise steeply, anyone actually using the town's beaches in Connecticut's wealthiest shoreline towns can't afford to live there anyways. And the only residents remaining are mostly private beach association members. In spite of this, non-residents without passes find ways of weaseling their way onto the town beaches. But that usually only works if you have the right, um, credentials as Andrew Carl puts it. He describes multiple incidents where, for example, uh, beachside exercise classes were stopped at the gate for having a few people of color among their ranks when they could just march through on any other day when no black or brown people were present in their group. Look, I know what some of you wonderful commenters are going to say about this video. The rich didn't steal the beaches. They bought them fair and square. And if poor people just drank less Starbucks and ate less avocado toast, then they too would one day have a multi-million dollar Greenwich beachfront property. Problem solved. The problem with that sentiment is that reaching that level of wealth is not about how nimbly you can climb the economic ladder. It's a matter of how much of a head start you were given. Putting a whites only sign on the economic ladder for the past century, permitting white people to dash up the ladder and then only recently allowing people of color to climb it one rung at a time is the furthest thing from a meritocracy that I can think of. You cannot possibly think that the current state of things is even remotely reasonable in any sense. And if you do, it's probably out of privilege or a delusion that you too will one day own a home in Greenwich, which I can tell 99.99% .99 of you that that will never happen. Even if you don't believe that everyone should be able to enjoy a day at the beach, which is a legal right in the state of Connecticut and many other states and nations, you should hopefully agree that rich people along the shore don't deserve our sympathy when the houses they built on fragile wetlands, often without the state's permission, get swallowed up by the sea. Unfortunately, not only do they receive sympathy, but they also receive millions of dollars pried out of the wallets of American taxpayers to insure their property and pay for the ecological damage they cause to the shore. Oh, and uh, let's talk about rich people's bodily waste, cause that's a problem. Old Lime Shores, in my personal opinion, is one of the poopiest places Places along the Connecticut coast. Their dilapidated septic systems have been leaking raw sewage into their soil for ages now, which doesn't sound too great for their property values. Lucky for them, the Connecticut government offered to cut them a check for $17 million to build a wildly expensive flood-proof sewer system for their community. That's right, the government wants to fund the construction of new infrastructure guaranteed by FEMA to be underwater in the next 100 years. What are Democrats and Republicans going to cut a check for next in the state of Connecticut? Building a summer cottage for Aquaman? These properties should be condemned and that money should go to wetlands revitalization. That area is a habitat for all sorts of adorable coastal creatures and it's not a suitable area for development. The reason why this nonsense occurs in Connecticut is due to the incredible levels of hypocrisy exhibited by these politicians. Both parties are guilty here because the politicians, whether red or blue, run on the same platforms and appeal to the same base. They perform a delicate dance appealing to the socially liberal values of the people in these areas while maintaining the status quo, which is welfare for the rich and over-policing and substandard housing for the poor. The residents of Old Lime Shores demonstrate the limits of being socially liberal and fiscally conservative in that they clutch the state purse strings so tight until their own feces starts seeping into their drinking water and poisoning their beaches, which are, to paraphrase Andrew Carl, private property one day and a vital public resource worthy of federal and state disaster relief on another day. These people claim to own the beach, but if our tax dollars are funding it, whose beach is it really? Ultimately, mother nature will have the last laugh. You can rebuild homes and construct as many jetties along the coast as your little heart desires. Those solutions to homeowners' first world problems 
are no match for the Long Island Sound. If these folks truly want to secure private ownership of the land they worked so hard for, they can have it. Cut off the funding, rename Old Lime and Greenwich to East and West Atlantis respectively, and then let them sink into the ocean. They don't even live there. Those are their fourth or fifth homes. This is obviously not a policy suggestion because it'll never happen, but I'm just saying. I hope everyone enjoyed this little rant and I highly recommend reading Andrew Carl's book because I, it's incredible and I only covered less than 1% of it in this video. If you enjoyed my diatribe and want to see more like it, consider funding my career on Patreon and don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.